Last Sunday, June, June 28, 2020, time is flying by. So glad you could join us this morning. We're going to uh, do our, our usual of a couple of praise songs and, and a hymn. And Pastor um, Jamie will be bringing our word this morning, taking his message from the book of Luke. So before we uh, get underway with the rest of worship, let us get ourselves prepared in heart, mind, and sing together.
voices together as we say responsibly the call to worship for this morning. Today is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let us be glad this day for life, for breath, and for freedom of worship. Blessed are you who come in the name of the Lord. We come, come to, to offer our gifts of praise and gratitude to the God of all creation. We sing a wonderful old hymn all about God's creation for the beauty of the earth. Presbyterian Church. My name is uh, Pastor Jamie. It's great to have you here on this Sunday morning. Uh, especially, I want to welcome any and all of you who are guests with us uh, watching this 
uh, with all of us on, on, online. And we hope that uh, when we open the doors, you'll come and be our uh, guest as well. Uh, just a reminder to those of you, uh, next Sunday, the first Sunday in July, we will have another uh, Zoom uh, fellowship meeting, a time to reconnect with everyone, and we will share in communion, and that will be at 10.30, 10.30 next Sunday for a, uh, a Zoom fellowship time, and we will share in communion. Also want to remind you, if, if Trinity is your church home, to continue to get in your, your tithes and your offerings and your giving. Um, you can bring them by the church, drop them off, give them to Maggie, or mail them in. That would be good. Please join me as, in prayer as we prepare our hearts. Oh God, we thank you for this new day. We ask that you would speak to us now through your word. May we have ears to hear, hearts to feel, and feet and hands that are willing to act. And we pray this in the good and great name of Jesus. Amen. A young man was at the post office waiting to mail his letters when an older man came up to him, handed him a postcard, and said, Young fellow, would you mind addressing this postcard for me? The young man said, Sure, I'd be glad to do that. He addressed it for him, gave it back to the man. He said, you know, would you mind just writing a short note? The young man said, sure, I'll write a short note. So he, the guy told him what to say, and he wrote the short note, gave it back to him. He said, hate to bother you, but would you mind signing my name? The young man said, sure, I'd be glad to, to uh, sign your name. Gave it back to him. Of course, the old man said, would you mind uh, putting a stamp on it? So he gave him a stamp, he put the stamp on it, he gave it back to him, and he said, is there anything else I can do for you, sir? The older gentleman looked at the postcard and said, gave it back to him, and he said, yes. Would you write a P.S.? Would you write, please excuse the sloppy handwriting? It's so easy to focus on what isn't rather than what is, isn't it? It's so easy to focus on what you don't have rather than what you do have. We seem to be forgetful about the good things that have gone on or are going on, and we remember what hasn't gone on or what isn't or what we lack. We tend to remember and see what's wrong rather than remember and see and give thanks for what's going right. And this is a huge issue to our spiritual health. This is a huge issue to our spiritual health. We're thinking about faith basics. We're thinking about basics of the faith. And each faith basic asks at least one question. Because if it's basic and foundational to the faith, we want to not just learn about it, but we want to live it out. In fact, if we don't live it out, we really haven't learned it. So we're thinking about faith basics, and they all begin with the letter G. The first faith basic we thought about was grace. Grace is foundational to our faith. It's the epicenter of our faith. And we uh, looked at the verse in Ephesians where Paul writes, It's by grace we've been saved through faith. It's the gift of God. And the question uh, that we ask is, have you received grace? Have you received the gift of God's grace and opened it up? And do you live by grace? Do you walk in grace? Grace was the first G. The second uh, G was gifts. Have you discovered your special gift or gifts or capacities or abilities or skills that God has given you so that you can help build up the church and in turn build up your faith, grace and gifts. Third week we talked about giving. And the focus for me on that Sunday was giving of the resources, primarily the financial resources, that God has allowed us to earn and keep. And the question is, do you know the percentage of your financial 
uh, giving that you give back to Arden Christian Church? And is that increasing year after year? Giving. Grace, gifts, giving. Fourth, we talked about gathering. And the question is, are you committed to meeting weekly for gathered worship and gathering in small groups? Foundational, critical to the faith. Last week, we talked about growing and maturing in the faith. And the question uh, was and is, are, are, you, are you training in private so that you can uh, act like Jesus acted in public? Growing. Are you growing in the faith? Are you, is the fruit of the Spirit more evident in your life? Love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control. Today, we're going to talk about gratitude. Gratitude, being thankful. You know, when you first think about it, it might not seem like gratitude is a foundational building block of the faith. I mean, it's easier, I think, to understand why grace and gifts and giving and gathering and, and growing is foundational, but, but why gratitude? Why being thankful? I mean, you might think, listen, I'm a little bit joy impaired. I'm not Mr. Thankful or Miss Positive. I'm not a, a count your blessings kind of person. I'm, I'm a kind of a, the glass is half empty, Eeyore type of person. You know Eeyore. Oh, why did I ever wake up this morning? It's going to be a bad day. You know, maybe you think that that's kind of my personality. This is just who I am. It doesn't really represent my faith or what I believe. Well, actually, I think it does. Actually, I think it does. Ingratitude, being thankless, is not just a personality quirk, but it's a serious spiritual issue that is a sign of what's going on inside of you. Let me just say that again. Ingratitude is not just a personality quirk, but it's a serious spiritual issue. Why? Because gratitude and grace go together. Gratefulness and grace go together. Gratefulness is a demonstration that you've received grace. Ungratefulness or thanklessness is a, uh, is a sign that perhaps you haven't received the gift of God's grace. When we are grateful, we remember, and remembering is a great word in the Old and New Testament. In the Old Testament, we're called, uh, they were called, the people of God were called to remember the Exodus. The Exodus where God rescued and redeemed God's people after 400 years of slavery. And they are to remember that, remember the Exodus. And the New Testament, of course, we are to remember that, that Jesus died on a cross and rose from the dead to rescue us from sin. Remember, two kinds of rescue. Rescue from slavery and rescue us from enslavement to sin in the New Testament. Remember. And gratitude uh, is a recognition of the remembering of God's grace. Remembering Grace, gratitude and, and grace go together. In fact, the word gratitude is from the same word, root word, that we get the word grace. Gratitude and grace is from the same root word. To not be grateful, what I'm saying is to forget the grace of God. I want to consider two passages this morning. The first in the Old Testament, Psalm 95. Psalm 95 was written so that the people of God would remember and recall God's saving rescue out of Egypt, out of enslavement, and the consequences of the Israelites, the first, the people of God, not remembering. Psalm 95 goes like this. Come, it's a, it's a call to invitation. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. 
Let us come before him with thanksgiving. Let us come before him remembering and being grateful. Let us come before him with thanksgiving. And let us make a joyful noise to him with music and song. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did at Meribah. As you did that day at Massah, we'll come back in just a second to Meribah and Massah in the desert, where your fathers tested and tried me, though they had seen what I did. Even though your fathers saw what I did, something happened at Meribah and Massah that hardened their hearts, and it showed itself in thanklessness. Because the psalmist is saying, come, let us come together with thanksgiving. Now, Meribah and Massah, those were places where God's people quarreled and complained and grumbled because they had no water. Meribah and Massah were places where the people of God forgot and they tried and they tested God. Remember the context, for 430 plus years, the people of God were enslavement, enslaved in Egypt to pharaohs. Year after year, decade after decade, century after century, finally Moses comes and rescues them. And they come into the desert. They're finally free. And how do they respond? They respond with great joy, with great gratitude, with thankfulness, with singing. For three days. For three days, and after three days, they forgot and they lost their faith. And the consequence of this ingratitude was huge. It was a huge spiritual issue that had real consequences. Psalm 95.10 For 40 years, God says through the psalmist, I was angry with that generation. I said, they are a people whose hearts have gone astray. See, thankfulness and your heart condition are connected. Gratitude and grace are connected. There are people whose hearts have gone astray and they have not known my ways. So I declared on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. Though they had seen what I did, though they clearly saw what I did and they remembered and rejoiced for three whole days. Wow! And then they forgot and their hearts grew hard and they never made it into the promised land. They wandered around in the desert till they all passed away and their kids and their grandkids got to go into the promised land. Being ungrateful or grateful is a measure of the grace in your lives. Being ungrateful can lead to a hard heart. Now, it's, it's significant, I think, that one of the signs of those who reject God's grace is ingratitude. One of the signs of those who reject God's grace is ingratitude or a thanklessness. Paul writes to the Christians in Rome these words. He says, For although they knew God, they neither glorified Him as God nor gave thanks to Him. But their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Another way to say their foolish hearts were hardened. Why? Because they, they didn't give thanks to God. Thankfulness helps us to remember or another way to say it, when we give thanks, we remember. Because we're giving thanks for the past and for what is and what was. Not for what wasn't and what isn't. Paul writes to young Timothy these words. But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful. Paul says one of the things that, that, that in the last days, which we're living in now, and we have been for 2,000 years, people will be ungrateful. It's a sign that their hearts are darkened and their hearts are hard. 
Now, Jesus told a story about this one time, and Luke recorded it. It starts out this way. Now, on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Gal Galilee. As he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. Jesus is going from the north to the south, from Galilee to Judea and Samaria's in the middle. And he went through Samaria. Now, most good Jews went around Samaria. It took two extra days to, to travel north, the 60 plus miles. But not Jesus. He goes through Samaria as he has been before. And why does he go through Samaria? Because he wants to connect with Samaritans. Now, Samaritans, as you may know, are half-breeds. They didn't look or sound or eat like the rest of the religious Jews. They were disenfranchised. Samaritans were outcasts. Samaritans were less than. And I envision Jesus walking through Samaria. And what's that he has on? It's a t-shirt. And the t-shirt says, Samaritans' lives matter. Now, oh, Jesus believed that all lives matter. God so loved the world. Jesus died for the world. Jesus didn't, didn't just die for the Samaritans. All lives matter. Yes. But Jesus focused on the lost, the least, the, the marginalized, the disenfranchised, the less than people, especially lepers. They got the focus and so often the attention of Jesus. Why? Why, why the lepers? Why did they get the focus? Because they were better than all people? No, because they were less than all people. That's the point. They weren't better than all people. They were less than all people. And those are the people that Jesus focused on. Yes, he came for all people. Yes, he died for all people. But he came specifically for the least, the lost, the disenfranchised. And Jesus would focus on those kinds of people. Later on in Jesus' journey, he came to a place called Jericho, and he met another disenfranchised person, a tax collector. And after his encounter with the tax collector, he would say, I have come to seek and save the lost. Oh, he came for everybody. He came for you and for me, but he particularly came and he focused upon, as did the prophets of the Old Testament, the least and the lost and the disenfranchised. He certainly came for all people, but he primarily focused his attention on the Samaritans and on the lepers and on the women and on the tax collectors, the disenfranchised of Jesus' day. And so Jesus comes, and Luke says this, The lepers stood at a distance, and they called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us! They stood at a distance. That was the law. Lepers had to stand at a distance. And they called out in a loud voice. They stood at a distance. They were humble, and they were needy, and they called out to Jesus two actions and one attitude or two attitudes in one action that Jesus responds to. They were humble, and they were needy. They knew their need, and they were humble, and they called out. Everyone was listening to them. They called out, Jesus, have mercy on us. Jesus responds to humble and the needy, and those who cry out, Jesus, have mercy on us. They're saying, Jesus, save us. Jesus, rescue us. How does Jesus respond? He says, go show yourselves to the priests. Now, normally, if a leper thinks they're healed, if they think there's some hope, they will go to the priests, and the priests will look them over, and if they are clean, the priests will declare that they are clean. And so they can return to their family and their friends and re-enter society. But in this story, Jesus says, go show yourselves to the priest before they were healed. 
they have to go to the priests knowing that they aren't healed. But they're following the voice of Jesus. They're, they have faith in Jesus. Healing happens on the road for them and for us. And as they went to the priests, they were healed. Luke continues, one of them, when he realized, when he saw he was healed, he came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. Luke is reminding us that he was a despised, disenfranchised Samaritan. Jesus asked him, Were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? And when I read that uh, this week, I kind of chuckled, and I wonder if in the, the mystery of the Trinity that Jesus looks at the Holy Spirit and, and God and asks, has, has not one returned to give thanks? Has only one returned to give thanks? Where are the other nine? Where are the 90%? Is only, does only 10% kind of realize and remember and give thanks? Jesus asked, what happened to the other nine? The other nine went on their way. They had taken God's grace for granted. They did not remember. Do you, do I, ever take God's grace for granted? Well, of course, of course we do, all the time. Years ago, I was reading in a Christian magazine, and I came across these questions, these piercing, penetrating questions that, that shows that this person is growing in gratitude. He writes these questions. Why was I born in a spotless delivery room in an American hospital instead of a steamy shelter in the dank jungle, in the Amazon, or in a mud hut in Africa? Why did I have to, the privilege of going to school with capable instructors while millions around the world without a school book sit or squat on a dirt floor listening to a missionary? How does it happen that my children are tucked into warm beds at night with clean white sheets while millions of babies in the world will lie in cold rooms, many in their own filth and vomit? Why can I sit down in a warm meal whenever I want to and eat too much when millions will know all of their lives the gnawing pangs of hunger? It's just so easy. To forget the grace of God and not give thanks. It's just, it's just really easy. In fact, most of us, maybe 90% of us, are just prone in the face of God's abundant grace and graciousness to us to forget and just move on with our lives. And we take it for granted. Now, in contrast to the majority of the lepers, this one leper's heart was overflowing with thanksgiving, which is a sign that he had entered into a new relationship with Jesus. His heart wasn't hardened. He saw and he perceived. In verse 19, Jesus says, Rise and go. Your faith has made you well. Made you well is another way of saying your faith has made you whole. So he didn't just receive Physical healing, Jesus seems to imply, but spiritual healing and emotional healing and relational healing. He had received God's grace and he returned to give thanks. So again, being thankful is an indication of what's going on in your heart. Remembering and then rejoicing and giving thanks is a sign is a means, is a measure of what's going on in your heart. That's why ingratitude and thanklessness is a serious spiritual issue, and it's foundational that you and I learn and remember to be thankful, because it is a measure, but it's also a means of keeping our heart soft and remembering. 
So how does one develop this attitude of gratitude? I was trying not to use that cliche, but I guess it came out. I can always edit it, but I don't think I will. So I have four thoughts of how we can grow in gratitude from this text. The first I just remember, I just mentioned, remember, remember, pur purposefully remember. Verse 15 says, when this leper, when he saw he was healed, when he saw he was healed, there's a way to see that we don't see. Jesus says you can have eyes but not see. He's saying you can see things but not perceive. But this one leper, he saw and pre he perceived. He slowed down and he perceived that not only was he healed, but someone had healed him. He remembered and he returned to rejoice. The leper saw he was healed and remember. And so to, to live the life of a leper was not living. He remembered what he was healed from. To live a life of a leper was, was not living, it was just surviving. If you were a leper, you had to separate yourself from the community, from family. You couldn't go to church. You couldn't go to your daughter's birthday. You couldn't go to a funeral. You couldn't go to a wedding. You couldn't earn a living. In fact, if you came into town for some reason, you had to carry a bell and ring it and ring it and shout out, unclean, unclean. And you had to look at people staring at you and, and turning away from you and sheltering their kids away from you. What would that feel like? It's not living, it's surviving at best. And when he saw he was healed, he, he re realized all that it would mean for him. And he was filled with gratitude, and he went back to express it to Jesus. No wonder this healed leper was so expressive. He, he fell at Jesus' feet, and in a loud voice, he thanked Jesus. When was the last time you fell at Jesus' feet, and in a loud voice gave thanks to Jesus? When was the last time I did that? When was the last time we did that in a worship service? And I'm reminded and convicted by the Holy Spirit that those who are healed from much praise much. Those who remember and realize all that is and all that we have because of grace praise much. Many years ago, I took a group of youth from Chicago to Mexico to build three homes, three homes in one week. Forty kids could build three homes in one week. And we were with a, a group of other students, about 150 from around the United States that week. And in the evenings, we would have worship services. There'd be a teaching and there would be singing. My kids would always, always sit in the back, unfortunately. And one night, the second night we were there, the, the band was up front playing, and a woman got up from her seat, and she got up on the stage, and she raised her hands. And my kids had hardly ever seen anyone raise their hands in a worship service. And she raised her hands, and she started dancing around, and she started saying, Thank you, Jesus! Thank you, Jesus! Oh, I love you! Thank you, Jesus! And she started crying. She was so so thankful and grateful and expressive. The next day, the next morning, our group met in, in the same room, just us. And as I was coming kid mo in, most of the kids were there. And as I walked in, I stopped because one of the kids was up on the stage. And he was up on the platform and he had his hands raised and he was dancing like the woman was dancing the day before. And he was saying, oh, praise you, Jesus. Oh, praise you, Jesus. <laughs> oh, praise you, Jesus. He was mocking the woman. And I was just about to go in to say something when I felt something on my arm. And I turned, and it was the woman. And she said, can I go address your group? And I said, yes, please do. And she got up. And for about 20 minutes, she shared her story. The short version is this. She said, you know, 15 years ago, I was a street person on the streets of San Diego. 
I had two children from two different men whose names I don't remember, and I was pregnant. I was a drug addict living on the street, no job except just meeting men after men and getting paid for it. I had no hope. I had no life. I had no income. I had no respect. I had no self-esteem. My life was going nowhere. And then someone told me about Jesus. Then someone told me that my sins could be forgiven, that I could have hope, and that I could have new life in Jesus. And so I confessed, and Jesus came into my life. And I'm a new person. I'm a new creation in Christ. And while I have lots of things to still work through and lots of consequences, I'm a new person. I'm free in Jesus. And then she said this, I don't judge you for your lack of joy. Please don't judge me for my exuberant joy. Wow. The kids were cut to the heart and they responded appropriately. But here's the point. When you see and perceive and remember and cry out to Jesus humbly and, and you know your need and you shout to him, Jesus, heal me. He heals. He forgives. And we can rejoice. Remember. Remember. It's so important to remember. That's why writing down what you can be grateful for and thankful for, and then going through it is so important. How can we grow in gratitude? Number one, remember. Number two, respond in obedience. Respond to the voice of Jesus. The lepers cried out, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. And what did Jesus do? He said, go show yourselves to the priests. Now that's kind of odd. That's counterintuitive because you would only go show yourselves to the priests when you were healed or you thought you were healed. But Jesus said to this to them before they were healed. In other words, he was challenging them to do something that didn't make sense. He was challenging them to do something that was counterintuitive, and they obeyed. They followed, and healing happened on the road when they followed Jesus at his word. How do we grow in gratitude? We remember. And number two, we respond in obedience. Paul writes to a church in Thessalonica these words, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Give thanks in all circumstances. Notice this doesn't say give thanks for all circumstances. Don't give thanks for cancer. Don't give thanks for car accidents. Don't give thanks for pandemics. Don't give thanks for divorce. Don't give thanks for abuse. Don't give thanks for injustice. But in all those things, Jesus is implying that those things, Paul is implying that all these kind of things are going to happen in the world in which we live. But in those things, learn to give thanks. That's a command. Remember and, and, and respond in obedience. Respond to the voice of Jesus. Third thing is repent of ingratitude. Our text says that the one leper came back. He turned around and came back. That's repentance language. That's repentance language. As I said earlier, Jesus responds to the needy. Jesus responds to the humble. And when we repent of ingratitude, oh Lord, thank, forgive me for, for my in, 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 in ungrateful spirit. Forgive me for my thankfulness. Help me, Lord. Help me, Holy Spirit, to give thanks in all things. And let me start with some things. And may I move towards all things. All things. Lord, forgive me for this attitude of entitlement. Forgive me for only thinking of my own needs. Forgive me for being in such a hurry to get on with life and not slowing down to see and perceive all that I have, all that is. Remember, respond in obedience. Repent of ingratitude. And you've heard me say this before, but I... We'll say it again. Repeat the scriptures. You can grow in gratitude by repeating the scriptures. Remember, 
Psalm 118, 24. I've asked you to remember, memorize it before. This, this is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it this day. Lord, I don't know if I can rejoice tomorrow. I don't know if I can't rejoice yesterday because it's, but, but this day, this morning, this hour, this minute, I can be thankful. I can be thankful. Repeat the scriptures, Psalm 118, 24. And of course, Philippians 4, 4 through 8. We talked about this several weeks ago where Paul says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. And I always chuckle. Why do you need to say it again? Because it's hard for us to be gracious. It's hard for us naturally to be thankful. It's hard for us to slow down and see what is and focus on what is and be thankful for what is. Two questions as you think about this message. Number one is, are you generally a thankful person? Are you generally a glass half empty or glass half full kind of person? What was your family system like? So this is one question. The question is, are you generally a thankful or more thankless person? And number two, what do you think you can do to become more thankful? I suggested four things. Remember, take a, a journal and write down things of what you can be thankful for. Respond in obedience as you read through the scriptures, as you listen to the Holy Spirit. Follow the voice of Jesus. Follow the voice of the Apostle Paul in the Word of God that says, Give thanks in all circumstances. Remember. Respond in obedience. Repent of ingratitude and repeat the scriptures. Is there something else you can do? Foundational to our faith is gratitude. May you, may I, may we grow in gratitude. Amen. Please pray with me. Oh God, you know that we tend to focus on what isn't and what should be and what ought to be and what could be, but what isn't. Help us, Holy Spirit, help us to grow in gratitude. And may we do the work, may we train ourselves, not just try, but train ourselves to be more thankful, more grateful, and may it soften our heart and keep it soft and supple. So we, may, so we may appropriately respond to grace. In Jesus' name, amen.
his children. as we trust in him so that our lives would overflow with hope by and through the power of the Holy Spirit, both now and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace.